<laughs> so welcome uh, everyone, Happy New Year. Um, uh, my name is Don Fisher, I am the interim principal and it's our first session for 2024 so we welcome you back, uh, old friends and, uh, and new friends. Um, the session tonight, well before I do that of course I should uh, uh, say as we, as we always do um, that we're grateful to be working and learning and living uh, on the territory, the unceded traditional and occupied territory of the Musqueam Nation. Um, we say it every time and, and, and it is important to say um, we, we, I think we are just at the beginning really of understanding what reconciliation is going to mean uh, and we're working our way through it, all of us, the uni not, not least the university and not least Green College. Um, where that will end or where it will go, we're not really sure. Uh, but I think it's a positive direction, clearly. So tonight, it's the first session in uh, a series where the new leading scholars will present their work in a preliminary sense. The Leading Scholars Program has been operating here for about 10 years. Uh, each year we invite, well, we send out a, an invitation and then people apply. Uh, folks who are in their first or their second year as faculty members here at UBC and we ask them uh, once they have applied and, and, they, and they seem to be suitable, in quotes, I'm not quite sure what suitable is in, in a real sense, but um, we invite them to come and be part of a cohort, uh, an interdisciplinary cohort. So we do strive to get as wide a range of disciplines and fields as possible. And then the uh, purpose of the program is bring those folks together, one, to get to know each other, to have interdisciplinary conversations. And in general, I think, provide a foundation not just for the work of the college, the interdisciplinary work of the college, but their own work here at UBC. Um, knowing UBC as I do, this is one of the few chances we, we get as individuals within departments to work with and meet from across campus. Uh, it used to be easier years ago, but it's not so easy now. So tonight, we were, we were to have three speakers. Unfortunately, Felix uh, is ill, so can't join us, so there are just two. Our session will be shorter than usual. We'll therefore finish around six, but uh, Roy, I'm glad to say, who runs the reception is bringing it forward, so we'll be able to go over direct to the reception at six rather than 6.30. Uh, the schedule, there were two speakers then, uh, Alexis, uh, and, and uh, Joel, uh, you've seen the program and they're going to be talking about their work so I'm not going to attempt to introduce it. Um, they are going to speak, each of them, for around 15 minutes and then I'll invite them to ask questions of each other and then we'll open it up to a conversation. Okay, so welcome everyone and Alexa, over to you. I think you've got you a mic. Can everyone hear me? Okay, um, thank you so much for the invitation um, to join you today for this sort of informal gathering to talk about our research. And I'm really glad to be here with Joel today um, to, to share some of, uh, some of my research, some of the research avenues I'm taking. Um, and just uh, uh, coming from a place of gratitude to, to join Green College community and being on Musqueam territories. Um, so my research, um, I'm an anthropological archeologist and my research focuses in on uh, multi-species frameworks interpreting the past um, in the Andean region of South America, so Western, South America. Um, I employ this particular uh, framework to be able to understand the relationality of life ways um, that embody and include both and uh, among um, uh, these elements included ecology, biology, as well as culture. Um, so um, through my research, um, trying to understand the past, how people are relating to their landscapes, their surroundings, um, how they are applying and um, how their worldviews are changing um, is very much in, um, uh, entangled and relational uh, system. So um, I first of all acknowledge that and then recognize that human life ways are not uh, life ways in which we are the sole um, factors of change, that our life ways being um, entangled in these relational networks are life ways that are interdependent as well as impacted by um, non-human species. 
my particular focus and my the methodologies that I apply um, is focusing in on animal species, um, in particular domesticated species of um, uh, South America um, and in the Andes region. Um, so I recognize this through long and enduring research into the ethnographic histories um, and ethno-historic histories of the Andes region that recognize and have recorded um, the long-held belief systems that animals do shape, um, impact, um, and help to reformulate people's worldviews, their culture, their food systems, and a number of, of, of other um, elements to, to people's everyday lives. So the ethno-historic record um, indicates to us the ways in which camelids, so llamas and alpacas, the domesticated camelid species, um, form an active part of uh, tracking time, um, form an active part in um, people understanding the uh, celestial bodies, um, dark constellations that we can see in the Milky Way. Um, and so clearly there is something at play around animal lives, animal life histories, um, underpinning uh, people's everyday um, and long-term practices. So my research, being animal focused, being multi-species focused, um, is really compelled to draw in multi-species frameworks. That is an approach that considers the, these variable relations that exist for communities that are not always defined as human. Um, these frameworks are inherently account, inherently account for different types of care, as well as attentions to, attention to the needs, constraints, as well as affordances of non-human beings. So both the positive elements of interacting with, caring for, and being dependent upon animals, but also some of the negative aspects and ways in which we have to curtail our time or dedicate certain parts of our schedules to caring for these non-human species. So a multi-species framework in my research is really important because it foregrounds these important ways that non-humans impact, influence, and transform human experiences through time. So I draw on a really um, a seminal research that has already tracked this through the um, ethno-historic as well as um, the sociocultural uh, record, um, the uh, contemporary record, uh, living communities in the region today that still classify, um, categorize, um, and understand different human beings as being associated with different animal species. One really excellent example of this is the work um, that had been, has been conducted in the Pacaritambo region of Cusco that actually has recorded um, contemporary populations linking uh, individuals of different life stages to different animals. So a grandparent, an elder, potentially being associated with a puma, so these apex predators, um, important, uh, powerful um, entities, and all the way to some of the earliest stages of life, such as a baby or a newborn, individual in a newborn phase, being associated with springborn animals and particularly deer. So there's clearly something at play in the Andes and uh, around how people structure their daily lives, how they categorize themselves, and how they find a sense um, of value in their surroundings. There is also really important uh, research that's um, indicated the ways in which there are analogous practices and how people go through their rites of passage and how animals um, under, undertake or pass through a, a particular period, important or potent period of time uh, in what we would consider a rite of passage. So one of these examples, um, is the ear cutting ceremony that's still conducted by many communities in parts of northern Chile. So one example in images you can find here by Penny Dransart in Isluga, Chile, where um, contemporary herding populations will cut the ears of their camelids. That actually parallels a similar practice that was undertaken by the Inca for right to passage of boys. So there's a sort of parallel set of practices that um, undergo and um, uh, follow uh, different species that humans are engaging with on a regular basis. So to, to kind of just tie together some of these themes um, that my research touches on, um, the, the ways in which um, uh, individuals, both in contempor the contemporary Andes as well as the, pa the, the past, would have seen their environments, would have understood their landscapes, celestial bodies, um, the changing uh, weather patterns and climates, were all um, paralleled with different animal bodies, different non-species um, entities. Um, this is one uh, summary of what some of those uh, associations actually look like. Um, so river bodies and associations with amarus or serpents, um, the um, ways in which precipitation falls um, in mountain landscapes, flows back to the coast, um, being guided by the yakana or a camelid figure. All of these tie into um, a, richly, uh, a richly diverse idea about how animals both are under the care of and can be influenced by people, but how that um, influence can also um, impact us. 
So the one of the contexts that my work has focused in on is on the dry desert north coast of the uh, of Peru of, of what is known as present day Peru, um, and I focused in on the phase um, that is known as the Moche cultural phase. This uh, phase uh, ex uh, extends from about 100 to about 900 CE, um, and it's an important phase in Andean archaeological um, the Andean archaeological past um, because it is a Debated to be kind of one of the first state um, for states of the of the of the area and for this particular period of time, you can also see um, very um, uh, skillfully crafted large monumental architecture ar architectural buildings um, that were used for ceremonial practices and in very uh, close connection with mountains um, serving as a, a symbolic um, icons. This particular period of time as well sees large funerary structures being built for elites. Um, you see um, uh, um, the extensive use of gold to be able to differentiate people by their potential social statuses, um, as well as a reinforcing of Andean dualism, where you see the pairing of silver and gold objects. Um, and in one particular case, as you can see on the slide, of um, a peanut necklace that does pair this, um, these two different materials. So my research um, in applying and, and trying to think through um, human-animal interactions, multi-species frameworks, is trying to understand in the Moche cultural phase what's happening to not only humans, but the animals in which they're caring for. This period of time, as I mentioned, um, uh, is the sort of first emergence of a state um, organization. It's also a period of time that emerges just as we start to see the sort of quelling and calming down of social strife from the period before. Um, and you start to see in the Moche phase really exquisitely crafted um, ceramic um, belongings, um, such as the ones that you can see here, of elite, uh, elite figures um, being depicted, as well as very detailed scenes, um, in one case on the slide here, of humans um, uh, battling uh, sea lions. So you can see the ways in which different species are coming up and being in, in, uh, injected into, the, into their artwork, into, their, into the ways in which their belongings are representing different figures, and animals are a key uh, set, multiple species are key sets of agents within these activities. My research focused in um, in the Jequetepeque Valley um, and continues uh, to, to draw from, from this research um, uh, at the site of Waco Colorada, which is this late Moche site. Uh, so just as the Moche, is, their power is starting to we wane in the region. And the site is important because it serves as sort of a natural barrier, one sort of final um, site um, within this, one of the southern um, uh, areas of influence. So you, you see it, it can kind of be considered as, as a site along a southern frontier uh, of one area of Moche influence. Um, the site um, itself had very well-preserved um, uh, uh, animal burials, um, as well as uh, multiple uh, belongings, um, archaeological belongings, uh, that do depict animal species, such as uh, feline um, uh, figures, um, as well as uh, the depictions of birds and many of their um, belongings themselves. And so my research focuses in on what are the broader trends and how animals are being used, uh, both at this site and others in the Andes. And my research tracks, again, some just visualizations, some, some of the data that I use um, to track the abundance of different species at the site, how it's being used. So um, my research applies this um, uh, broader uh, methodological technique uh, known as archaeology, so trying to identify different animal species through the remains of animal bones um, and tracking how that is different depending upon the context, um, what is the level of care, um, treatment, butchery patterns, all of that being impacting those, um, those species in different contexts to be able to make, not only make a statement on the foodways, how people are actually acquiring resources to then share among themselves, share among the broader community, but also how um, social and political negotiations are um, key factors in those um, distributions. One of the last techniques that I use in my research involves looking at the chemical signatures of, um, of animals as well as humans um, uh, in different contexts in the Andes and just some example visualizations of the data that I use trying to track dietary variability. So you can see some of the ways um, in which our diet varies um, dependent upon the um, types of resources we're consuming. So as humans consuming potentially more corn, um, so uh, a plant that is heavier in carbon, we will skew to um, the, the right side of this graph. Um, but then animals likely subsisting on potentially corn, but also wild plants that have uh, lighter carbon signatures, they will skew to the left side of the graph. So we can see dietary heterogeneity um, and very diverse uh, uses of animals um, across contexts, not only at this site, but, uh, but the Andes more broadly. And my research has been able to detect very nuanced ways in which people are negotiating their involvement 
involvement in ritual activities, bringing in animals from farther afield, um, such as in ceremonial contexts where we have a larger dietary heterogeneity, indicating that there were likely communities coming from farther away to be able to participate, offer up their animals, and be involved in these uh, feasting rituals. Um, so some of these visualizations you, you, that you can see here does show that, that tr uh, drastic difference in the locality and origin of where these animals uh, are coming from. And then finally, just some of the ways that my, my data is indicating and, and, and again, uh, uh, analyzed through a multi-species perspective, not only being able to um, undertake this research not on, 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 on animals themselves, being able to look at their osseous tissues, and then being able to connect patterns of how the physical animal remains at the site might compare to the, the, the broader material record, um, but really emphasizing this level of heterogeneity as well as um, investment from different communities from around the Andes. Um, my multi-species approach to archaeological work um, has allowed me, in collaboration with colleagues, um, to start to look at the landscape in different ways. Um, so um, this is a set of two images on the right-hand side of the slide of a stone wanka, or monolith, at the top of an important mountain in this region of the Hecatepeque Valley. Um, and walking with my local collaborator, um, discussing and sort of having camelids and animals on the mind, um, my local collaborator, who's, who's local to the region, um, we looked at this monolith, was sort of struck by its shape, and we got into conversations around um, the potential of these different monoliths for different individuals, communities, both in the past and in, pres in the present, to represent uh, potentially non-human entities and potentially to represent animals. So one of the ideas that, that um, and is important to keep in mind is the different epistemologies and worldviews that guide how people interact with these landscapes and how they incorporate these uh, resources into their everyday as well as uh, long-term practices. So that's where my research is, um, is situated. Um, it's ongoing in uh, not only the Hecatepeque region, but in other regions of the Andes. Um, and I'm really grateful, I come from standing up here today, a place of gratitude to work with these communities and to have joined you to share some of these ideas at this event tonight. So thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Joel Finbloom. Um, really a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to share with you a bit of my research and my research interests. Um, I'm in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences here at UBC. My background is really a mix of chemistry, biochemistry, and bioengineering, um, really with a focus on how we can turn to nature and biological systems and take inspiration from those systems in building better materials, and specifically nanoscale materials and nanotechnology to advance biomedicine. So we'll talk a bit about some of these different concepts. Um, but first, I really, again, just want to reiterate um, my acknowledgement, my gratitude to be here um, on the UBC Point Grey campus, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Musqueam people. So when we think about, you know, particularly nanotechnology and biology and how these two fields can come together, we really need to think about the size scale of what we're looking at. Um, so nanotechnology, meaning nanoscale, um, one one billionth of a meter is a nanometer. Um, and here, thinking about biology, we really span all the ranges um, that we're thinking about. So a human hair, yes, so in context, a hair, a single human hair has the width of 100 micrometers. So a micrometer is one millionth of a meter. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So this is 100 microns or micrometers in diameter. DNA, the width of DNA is about two nanometers. A virus, like the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that infects and causes COVID, is about 100 nanometers. So 100 nanometer virus versus 100 micrometer hair. That's a one one thousandth difference right there. And so you can see that biology really spans the, these size scales, ranging from you know, a virus in that 10 to hundreds of nanometers. A bacteria is typically on the length of about one micrometer. And as we progress into our cells, red blood cells are about four micrometers, and animal cells are about 20 micrometers. Still keeping in mind that human hair, for reference, is 100 micrometers. So we're still much smaller than that. Um, but thinking about biological processes, systems, and especially biomedicine, if we're trying to deliver, if we're trying to target uh, a cell, a red blood cell, if we're trying to treat a bacterial infection, 
Yes, we can use what's traditional synthetic molecules or small molecules like antibiotics, but if we really want to interface or engage with these biological systems on the scale of size that they've been evolved to engage with, we really want to think nanoscale and maybe microscale. So that's where material science and engineering can come into play here, and we can use advanced material science and engineering technologies to create what's called micro and nanotechnology. Um, and my research mainly is focused on the nano side here. And these are very small devices or materials, typically between about 10 nanometers and 1,000 micrometers. Um, they can be made really of anything. So they can be made of plastic polymers, they can be made of naturally derived molecules or building blocks like proteins or DNA, they can be made out of metals like silver or gold. And what's really fascinating about the nanoscale is that some of the properties of these materials are dependent on their size. So here you can see a really cool example where you can create nanoscale particles, little um, gold nanoparticles, either spheres or these rod-shaped materials, and as you increase their size, when they're in suspension, they diffract light differently and have different optical properties. So that's just one example of how the size is actually really important to function. Um, we can also create some really beautiful and intricate designs. These micro flowers don't really have a function, but I just wanted to show them here because they really uh, are an example of how amazing and fine-tuned some of these processes can be. So this is obviously not a real flower, but it has the same size or same shape of these flowers, but is 25 micrometers in diameter. So about one quarter the width of a human or the diameter of a human hair. And additionally, we can take advantage of certain biological processes like DNA base pairing, how that double helix is formed. We know so much about that process that we can program DNA strains and sequences to come together to base pair into different shapes and sizes like these smiley faces here that are about 100 nanometers in diameter. So these are some really cool examples. We can make smiley faces, we can make flowers, different co pretty colors. In terms of biomedicine, one of the main application areas of nanotechnology is to better deliver drugs. To better package drug cargo inside one of these nanoparticles that can then traverse through the body and reach that site of interest. So if we want to better deliver antibiotics, we can target that to an infection site. If we want to deliver chemotherapeutics, we can target that to the tumor and hopefully reduce some of the side effects through the regular systemic injection of a chemotherapeutic. If it's encapsulated or inside this particle, it hopefully won't have its effect until it reaches that tumor site. Um, and one of the best known examples of this is actually the COVID vaccine. So here we have nanoparticles made out of lipid, fat molecules, that come together to form these spherical nanoparticles. And inside these nanoparticles, we can have mRNA. Uh, and actually, this nanoparticle technology um, was really, um, in part, pioneered by a researcher here at UBC named Professor Peter Cullis, um, who helped develop some of the COVID vaccine technology. Um, and in that case, rather than specifically targeting a site of interest, we're extending the circulation time of the mRNA so it has more time to go through our body and help produce those important antigens to um, fight off infection. Um, and so I'm very interested in how we can better target drugs to that site of interest, particularly within the space of bacterial infection treatment. Um, and really, we want to think about this, um, and this is an analogy that's used pretty frequently in the field, um, like uh, you know, a delivery truck. And think about all the different parameters that need to be aligned and need to be thought about in order to make sure that your cargo reaches where it's coming from to where it's going and it arrives in one piece, right? So how do we best design this system to improve our drug delivery? So we need to think about the cargo loading. Do we have enough space for our cargo inside our delivery vehicle? Um, is there uh, the ability to load our cargo with high efficiency, or do we only have one small package in an entire truck and we're not using our space as well as we need to be? Additionally, what about the size of our nanoparticle or our delivery vehicle? 
Um, you know, we need, if we need to package a lot of cargo, maybe we need a larger vehicle. But if we need to traverse through some of the really tight channels within a tumor, right, maybe we don't want a very large particle that can't fit through that very small space. So, and that's not even getting into, you know, the analogy of GPS directions to make sure that we actually reach that tumor or to reach that infection. And so by using material science, by using chemical um, engineering and chemistry to really design our nanoparticles, their size, their shape, some of their surface properties, we can hopefully improve their ability to target regions of interest and interact with our biological targets. Um, and so my research area is very focused on bacterial-related disease, particularly bacterial infections, and really trying to address this global health crisis of antibiotic resistance, uh, where antibiotic resistant rates are accelerating rapidly across every known class of antibiotic. And the World Health Organization has declared that, um, or has estimated that if we don't do something to address this crisis, we can enter a post-antibiotic era where infection um, or where deaths caused by antibiotic resistant infections could increase tenfold annually, up to 10 million deaths per year by 2050. And one of the main ways in which bacteria um, create resistance is by living in what's called a bacterial biofilm. So rather than imagining these bacteria shown here in this microscope image in green um, as free floating in a solution or in you know, your bloodstream or whatever, Instead, these bacteria produce this fibrous material shown here, this porous fibrous material made out of sugars and proteins and fat molecules that then encase the bacteria within this larger environment. And so this, what's called a biofilm, this fibrous um, architecture, can help prevent antibiotics from reaching the bacteria and this fibrous network of the biofilm is estimated to take up up to 90% of the space of an infection. And these biofilms are estimated to occur in up to 80% of human infections. So this is very prevalent and is a very serious problem um, to treat in the clinic. And so these biofilms are found in fracture infections, in chronic wounds, such as in diabetic foot ulcers, and also in other chronic infections like in cystic fibrosis lung infections. And that was where I focused my research for my postdoctoral um, fellowship at University of California, San Francisco. Um, and there, I was very interested in, again, using nanotechnology to encapsulate antibiotics, in this case, combinations of different antibiotics that can work together to enhance their efficacy and overcome resistance. So if we can take multiple antibiotics and put it into a single drug carrier, and then we can do some engineering to really design the surface of these materials, because it's the surface of the nanoparticles that are going to interact with our biological system. They're going to be the first thing that touches this biofilm. And so the surface properties, such as some of the chemistry, the chemical molecules that are being displayed on the surface, um, will dictate how these particles move through this biofilm space. And so traditional antibiotic therapy gets stuck along the outer region of a biofilm and isn't able to reach the bacterial targets. But if we have our, our antibiotics packaged within this nanoparticle, we can engineer the materials to better penetrate through this biofilm environment and better diffuse the drugs throughout. And so you can see here, these is microscope images of a biofilm that I grew in lab, um, where the live bacteria are shown in green and dead bacteria are shown in pink. Our drug on its own, this tobramycin, doesn't really cause any loss in viability. These biofilms still grow very well. But when we have our nanoparticles that can move through these environments more effectively and deliver combinations of therapeutics, we can overcome that resistance and um, completely eradicate these biofilms. We also tested these materials in mouse models of lung infection, um, where a mouse on its own in this control shown here in black succumb to their infection within 12 to 16 hours without any intervention. But when we have our nanoparticles, we can extend that life of these mice um, in 8 out of 10 of the mice within the study, and we can clear the infection in a well-tolerated manner. So this is a very promising approach to improve drug delivery to treat um, antibiotic-resistant infections. Um, but I haven't really talked about the whole bio-inspired part yet. Um, and so 
I really am hoping with my independent research here at UBC to innovate on drug delivery strategies to take inspiration from naturally occurring systems that already interface between materials and biological processes to really advance drug delivery applications. So turning to nature and biology as sources of inspiration for us when designing new kinds of nanotechnology. Um, so I just want to briefly touch upon three different projects within my lab here at UBC, all taking inspiration from different biological systems to advance drug delivery. Um, so the first project is taking inspiration from neutrophils, which are a class of white blood cell that circulate through your body and is the first line of defense for a bacterial infection. And neutrophils do this amazing thing where they sense bacteria and then they excrete their own DNA um, to form these network-like nanoscale structures shown here in this image. And this entraps bacteria and releases antibiotic-like compounds to kill the bacteria. So we're creating nanoparticles that in response to bacterial cues increase in size, trap, can trap bacteria, and also release antibiotics at the same time to improve their efficacy. Another project in the lab is taking inspiration from viruses um, to improve the uh, movement of nanoparticles through that biofilm-like space. So the influenza virus has this dynamic on-off interaction between the virus and mucus um, within our lungs and within um, our nasal cavities um, that helps the virus move through mucus-like materials and increase infectivity. And so you can see that the red and the blue um, proteins displayed on the virus, similar to those um, spike proteins that people talk about with COVID, the blue ones engage with the mucus and the red ones cut off that engagement. So you have this dynamic on-off walking effect of this virus through the mucus and material or through the mucus environment. And so if we can create a synthetic version of that where we create nanoparticles with one kind of displaying molecule that interacts with the biofilm and another kind that um, disrupts that interaction, we can hopefully create this on-off dynamic system of movement to improve drug diffusion and targeting within the biofilm space. The last project that we're um, working on is actually taking inspiration from the biofilm itself. And rather than looking at um, pathogenic bacteria and bacterial infections, we're focused on therapeutic bacteria, such as probiotics which have immense promise to treat a lot of diseases, including gastrointestinal disorders like IBD. But when you consume a probiotic um, by swallowing a pill, most of those bacteria are going to die within your stomach acid. And so we need a way to better protect the bacteria until they can reach um, your microbiome, your other bacterial communities within the colon where, where they can do the most good. And so the biofilm is a natural way in which bacteria protect themselves, encase themselves within a nanostructured material. And so by taking um, the most simple motif within this biofilm, a small peptide, so like basically a small protein fragment that can come together and form these nanofiber-like structures, we're hoping to encase bacteria within this nanofibrous um, uh, material similar to a biofilm to improve its protection and health and function after we orally administer these probiotics. Um, and so this work would not be possible without my many collaborators and mentors along the way. I'm particularly wanted to thank my um, postdoctoral advisor, Tejal Desai at UCSF, who helped um, lead that project that I talked about with the cystic fibrosis lung infections, as well as uh, members of my lab here and a student I'm co-supervising still at UCSF. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and happy to have a discussion. Um, so yeah, I was curious, you know, because you you are working in an interdisciplinary setting, but also like an interdisciplinary so different from my own. Um, although I did appreciate the bits of chemistry um, that you showed, I was just kind of curious, like, what are some of the challenges that you've encountered um, with this like level of interdisciplinary research, and particularly like looking at some of the animal remains and some of the chemical methods and things along those lines. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, so it's a really good question. I think in general, in, in archaeology, kind of anthropology more broadly, um, it, it kind of toggles between other disciplines quite well. Um, there are obviously positive to that, but can, there can be drawbacks. I think one of the ways, at least in archaeological research, that I find um, there can be difficulties is the ways in which some of the scientific applications, so archaeological science methodologies, 
um, contribute really important data sets and lines of evidence to be able to interpret past life ways, but sometimes fall short of um, really connecting with the ethnohistoric record, with uh, contemporary communities and, and their oral histories, um, and oftentimes kind of stops at food ways, but doesn't go beyond sort of the nutritional value of what animals um, contribute to people's societies. So that might be one of the ways that I see the difficulty in these um, kind of interdisciplinary collaborations. And then on the flip side, um, some of the kind of the more um, theoretical avenues that can be taken in my work, especially with maybe kind of pure, pure discussions or conversations around multi-species frameworks is it's not tethered as tightly to what's happening on the ground. And so it can come, come sometimes sit kind of in the clouds, but doesn't actually um, connect as well to uh, what people are dealing with on a regular basis, but also what are the um, overall consequences of the research. So talking about what's happening in the past does not um, eliminate what's happening in the present. How are certain um, um, practices continuing on to this day? Um, but also some of the reservations we have about assuming that these communities have, have not changed through time. So I find that that's the sort of internal tension that I find in that collaborative work. But nonetheless, people are really open to sort of having those those things pointed out and want to kind of come to, to, to the center to, to meet all the demands of, of the project. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I had a question. I was really struck by your sort of terminology of being inspired by nature um, and some of the ways in which you see your field and your discipline um, engaging with some of the, I don't want to necessarily say um, hu humanities like discussions around how we take inspiration from, but do you find that there's, that, that your own discipline is changing and the types of conversations people are having and the openness around language? And because that struck me in hearing your presentation around that terminology. Yeah, I think that um, just like getting into some of the terminology there, um, there is like this discipline, like I talked about, of, of bio inspiration um, or natural nature based inspiration, where you look through, um, you know, essentially what nature has evolved over millions of years, and you're just kind of like struck in awe by how amazing some of these processes are. You're also struck in awe by sometimes how inefficient some of these processes are. Um, but I think that. Uh, the field of like bio-inspired materials, I think, does give a greater like appreciation, I would say, of biology and of nature. Um, and I think that there's a lot of kind of like interesting overlap there, maybe with like ecology, for instance, and kind of like appreciation for you know the millennia, if not millions of years, that it's taken for some of these biological processes to evolve to that point. Um, I would also say that within the field, there are also some kind of tensions or, or divisions um, between, you know, there are two main classifications within the style of material. There's the bio-inspired material, um, which is kind of where I work, where we don't really try and recreate it. Instead, we look at these processes and say, how can we make like a synthetic version, um, but like a little different. And then there's, it's, it's subtle, but there's also like biomimetic ideas. So um, really trying to mimic what happens in biology. And I think an amazing example of that is actually uh, some of camouflage technology. So um, like octopuses and um, cuttlefish have these ama like absolutely amazing camouflage technologies, which is actually all nanomaterials. Um, if you look at the biological materials that these octopus um, produce, they are these nanoscale materials that how they move around and how they can change the size and the shape actually change how they diffract light. And so some of the optical properties there are more mimetic. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that like overall, though, it does give you a greater appreciation of nature. And it, there's a lot of studies where um, you kind of just like read a basic biology paper, like a fundamental biological sciences paper or an ecology paper, and you're like, wow, that's amazing. How does this biological system do that? And you really dive into the more material science or the chemistry to take lessons from there. Um, and that's also a whole field of research is actually just trying to analyze how the octopus does that process. Because if we don't understand it, then we can't mimic it or we can't be inspired by it as much. Um, I guess a, a question kind of biased toward my research, um, you know, you're talking about like this multi-species lens uh, in terms of like anthropology and archeology. span um, And I'm just like fascinated by how, you know, n not only the food level of the multi-species, but the microbial 
uh, multi-species and how like the microbiomes of people have changed over time and how related that is to the animals um, that we're eating and the food that we're eating. And I'm just kind of curious um, within the field if there's like research in like anthropological microbiology, I guess, or if that's uh, something people are considering or thinking about. I don't even know. I don't even know how you analyze um, So one of the potentials is, it's a good question because from um, sitting, kind of sitting in my perspective, the way that that has been studied is by through the bioarchaeological record, um, and so specifically looking for um, osteological markers for things like tuberculosis, for example, that was widespread throughout the Andes pre-contact, pre-colonization, um, and trying to understand what are the avenues through which tuberculosis has spread through different populations in the Andes. So um, work has detected that likely tuberculosis was coming from um, likely um, uh, sea lions. And so interactions with sea lions, consumption of their meat, and potentially being in contact with um, other entities they're consuming would have potentially spread tuberculosis. But one of the missing links is how tuberculosis got into the highland region. So we know if it's a coastal source of tuberculosis, likely it's affecting coastal populations. But is it person-to-person -person spread? People are probably detecting other people are sick. Maybe they're not interacting with them. So how did it actually uh, become widespread in the Andes? So one of the actual um, species that's likely culprit as a uh, kind of reservoir are guinea pigs. Because guinea pigs are living with people in their houses. And there hasn't been direct research that's been done yet to try to understand what are the avenues of distribution or um, um, uh, the dispersal of tuberculosis. But likely because people are actively, they're undertaking active uh, guinea pig husbandry. They're usually kept in cubbies and potentially in pens and kitchens, so they're they're inside people's homes. And likely, if they are being, um, uh, if they are themselves sick from tuberculosis, likely people in the households would have been at a higher risk of contracting tuberculosis. So that's one of the ways I think a multi-species lens could help is by trying to understand what are these reservoir effects, um, and then doing active, more targeted research towards those species. So giving the proper attention we should to like a broader multi-species world as opposed to always assuming human exceptionalism and it's people, 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 they're the ones that are guiding the, the, the actual transmission of this disease, but it's actually um, often, often the case, um, non-human species. So, um, <laughs> uh, sure, I feel like I'm, I'm hogging the mic, though. No, 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 please, well, I mean, I'm hogging it by asking. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was just kind of curious, like, if you've encountered or if the field of, like, multi-species perspective has encountered pushback, just like you were talking about, from, like, the human-centric perspective. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. It's something that's come up more and more. So um, multi-species perspectives in broader anthropology has gotten a bad rap for being exclusively post-human, but it's not. A multi-species framework um, tries to give a sort of better attention to a multi-species world, understanding those dynamics. Um, but there has been pushback because removing humans, especially if anthropology is a discipline, is the study of people. If you're like not, if you're decentering people, like what are you doing as a discipline? So that's one of the ways in which there's been pushback. It's like if we're decentering people, what are we studying? One of the yeah, but it's a good point. But one I think one of the really um, uh, effective counter arguments to that is not about decentering people to. To, to state that they're not important, but it's about understanding that, depending upon the epistemologies and worldviews, recognizing there would have been different levels of respect and value to other other species, likely allows us to interpret human uh, human communities better. Because if we're able to recognize that in different structures, different different um, worldviews, people are not at the center, that it's other species and these dynamics with these other species, then we can likely get at a more accurate picture of the past. So. Great question, though. I think that that's um, an important critique. <laughs> Good. That's great. Yeah. Uh, just exactly what we thought.